Hello, pastors and leaders, and thank you for joining me for another episode of Spirit Anointed Leadership. I'm so blessed to have this time with you. And, you know, our heart and our desire is simply to encourage, equip, and empower you as we go after the mission that God has given us to reach as many people for him as possible. Now, I'm on this podcast and VCast solo today because I just want to talk to you from my heart for a few minutes. I want to talk to you about a subject that I think is so incredibly important to all of us. I think it impacts our future. I think it impacts what God is allowed to do in our lives. I think it impacts the things that God wants to do in the lives of our church. Absolutely. And unfortunately, I think many pastors and leaders get it wrong. I know I've gotten it wrong so many times, and it has cost me dearly. And here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the difference between deciding and discerning. Deciding versus discerning. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. Ah, I get it. I understand. But I just want to push back on you. Do you really understand? Because here's the thing. What I find fascinating is, is that those people who have been in a relationship with Jesus Christ for even a little while end up hearing this verse out of Proverbs, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, right? Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Hmm. And all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. It says right there, don't lean on your own understanding. But guess what I found about me and about the leaders and the pastors that I'm blessed to do life with? So many of us do exactly that. We lean on our own understanding. We lean on our own insights and direction. If we kind of say, well, you know, I guess what James chapter four says is, uh, and James chapter one in different places, it says, hey, if you lack wisdom, James one, if you lack wisdom, just ask of God and he'll give it. And so what do we do? We ask God for wisdom. And then what do we do after that? Then we do whatever we think we ought to do. We just go forward in any direction that we think we ought to go in. Hey, you know what? I prayed for wisdom. I asked for it. Now I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. And unfortunately, I think that kind of mindset costs us so much. See, I think human wisdom ends up producing human results where godly discernment results in supernatural power. And I have to tell you, I'm so tired in my own life of seeing human type of responses, human type of results. I'm so desperate to watch Holy Spirit show up and do what only he can do. So that at the end of the day, he gets all the praise, he gets all the glory, and I shake my head and I say, only God could have done that. There's no way I could have done that. Now, again, you might be thinking, ah, Chris, I'm not sure this is all that big of a deal. Well, let me give you one little example out of my own life, and I could give you literally hundreds of these out of my own life, but let me just give you one. So my wife, Mary, and I had planted a church um, in the upper Midwest, and it had gone, for whatever reason, it had gone really, really well. And a bunch of people had come into a relationship with Jesus Christ and were being discipled and growing in their relationship with Christ. It was awesome. And after being there for six and a half years, we felt, we discerned, and that's a key thing, we discerned clearly that God was calling us to another place. And that was a discernment process that Mary and I entered into, and we knew that God was calling us to the greater Madison, Wisconsin area. So we picked up and we said goodbye to the people that we loved, and we moved away, and we moved to Madison, Wisconsin. Now, when we got to Madison, I just assumed that we were supposed to plant a church in Madison, Wisconsin. And in those pre-launch days, when we're kind of checking out the area of Madison, Mary felt in her spirit, you know, Chris, I think maybe we're supposed to plant in this suburb the suburb of Madison called Wanakee. I'm thinking, no, I didn't move halfway across the country to plant in some suburb out six miles away. No, 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 we're planting here. And can I be honest with you? I didn't pray about it. I didn't seek the Lord about it. I didn't try and discern it. I just said a flat no. So we planted in Madison, and I would tell you we were there for six and a half years. And if anyone ever wonders, have you ever pastor to a small church. Yep. Church of Madison, Wisconsin. Never got past 100. It was um, on our high days, we would have 90 or 100, but we averaged 75 people. We certainly had days when there were 30 people in the room. I know what it's like to communicate to 30 people on a Sunday. I certainly know what that's like. 
Here's what's fascinating. That church doesn't exist any longer. We were there for six and a half years, just like we were at our first church. And someone came in after us and took it over, and it lasted for a few years, but that church ultimately closed down. Meanwhile, a, a good friend of mine, whose name is Brent Bickle, planted a church, guess where? In Wanakee, six miles outside the town of Madison. Guess what? Northridge, which is part of this little grouping of churches that we call the Great Lakes region, uh, they're averaging about 300 people now on a Sunday morning in Wanakee. Now, I'm not saying that God didn't care about the people of Madison. Of course he did. I'm simply saying that I think I got that wrong. I went with human wisdom. And here's what you need to understand. So many people's lives had been changed in our first church plant. I was I was working on a sense of momentum, like things were going in the right direction. I, f- I felt like, hey, I know how to hear God's voice. If I didn't know hear- how to hear God's voice, how would we have seen the blessing of God that we got to see there at the first church plant? But then I stopped. And I allowed, if you will, success to get in the way of discernment. And I wonder, I wonder how often you and I Just kind of say, well, God, I think I've got it from here. I'll take it. Thank you very much. And how often Holy Spirit wants to breathe into our spirits and say, ah, would you let me please, would you let me speak into your life the things that I want to say in and through you, the things I want to do in and through you? Would you take the time to discern instead of deciding? Let me give you a couple of biblical examples of that, okay? Let's go back to the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before Jesus was crucified. As you know, he's praying to the Father, and he says, Father, if it be your will, allow this cup to pass from me, but not my will, your will be done. Jesus had a way that he would have loved the next 24 hours to go, but he surrendered his will to the Father. And as a result of that, you and I can experience salvation. Sometimes that prayer of Jesus' in the Garden of Gethsemane is called the prayer of indifference. It doesn't mean he was indifferent to the answer. It meant, Heavenly Father, I want your will more than I want my will. Now, I know that that's a thing that we say almost flippantly, yeah, I want God's will over mine. But how often do we stop? Get quiet and discern the good, perfect, and pleasing will of God. I think so often, we don't. We just decide. And we end up being satisfied with human results when God wanted to download into our spirits supernatural thoughts, supernatural insights, supernatural direction, direction we would never have gone in on our own. We never would have gone that direction on our own. But we sensed Holy Spirit saying to us, go in this direction. And that was confirmed in some way, shape, or form. And wow, look what happened. Let me give you a second example. Acts chapter 1. You know, Jesus um, has ascended now, and the disciples are hanging out together in the upper room. And Pete says, hey, you know what? There used to be 12. Judas went the way of all mankind. He went and hung himself, so there we go. Um, And uh, we got to have 12, because 12 is the magic number. Um, I'm not sure it was, but Pete felt it was at the time. So he said, we got to do something. So uh, they kind of prayed this quick prayer, God, would you lead us in the way that you want us to go? And they prayed that prayer, and then you know what they did? They rolled dice. They rolled dice, and the numbers came up to this guy by the name of Matthias. Again, two people were chosen, You know, they said, okay, God, show us between these two people. And it came up to Matthias. He was the guy through throwing dice was chosen. Now, here's where the interesting thing is. Never once do you hear Matthias's name used again throughout the New Testament. Never once. Contrast that to Acts 13. Acts 13, the church at Antioch is together. And they're in an intense time of prayer and fasting and just asking Holy Spirit, where are you guiding us? Where are you directing us? And during that time, Holy Spirit said to them, 
set apart for me Paul and Barnabas for the work that I've called them to. And interestingly enough, you know what scripture says? Go back and read it, Acts 13. And after they prayed and fasted some more, they set their hands on Paul and Barnabas and anointed them for the work that God had called them to. So they discerned it, first of all. It wasn't some kind of decision. Paul didn't get up one day. Barnabas didn't get up one day and say, hey, we're going to go out on this missionary journey. They didn't even have that terminology back then. Of course they didn't say that. It's not what happened. What happened was is that they were in a time of prayer and fasting, focused on the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit said to them, this is what I want to do. And as you and I both know, you see Paul's name all the time after that in the book of Acts. And Barnabas, too, in those chapters 9, 10, and 11. It's fascinating. Matthias's name never used again. Paul and Barnabas turned the whole world upside down. I don't know about you, but I'm tired, so tired, of names that never get brought up again, ideas that just flounder and fail. How I want things that are going to turn the world upside down for the glory of God. That's what I want to be involved in. Let me, let me make it really painfully clear to all of us. This isn't easy to say, but decisions, they can happen really quickly. Discernment often relates to patience and waiting on Holy Spirit and getting into your prayer closet, whatever that means for you, and praying and seeking him and praying and seeking him and praying and seeking him and not going forward until you've heard his voice. Now, I know, I know how this really works out. How this really works out is that you feel like you're under the gun, like I've got to make a decision. I get that. I understand that. I understand that decisions have to be made, and I understand that deadlines happen. I get all that. Here's the thing. I think we can still go to the Heavenly Father and spend enough time in prayer where we're saying, Heavenly Father, this is the direction that I sense. If you want to tell me anything different, please reveal that to me in my spirit and give him that time. Don't just say that and then get up in prayer and, and go on to your day. Give him the time. And the best is when we give him a period of time. Let me give you a third and final example. Acts 15. We all know it's the Council of Jerusalem is what it's called. And what's happened is that you got this great work of God that's happening up in the Church of Antioch. All kinds of people have come to Christ. And there are some people from Jerusalem that have gone up there and tried to make sure that the people of Antioch got, Antioch got circumcised. And, you know, Paul and Barnabas and the gang are saying, wait, 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 wait. We're not trying to start a Jewish sect here. This is a whole new revelation from God. This is new wineskin. Holy Spirit and Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, are wanting to do something new. We don't have to have people circumcised. What are you guys thinking? So they come back to Jerusalem, and there's the Council of Jerusalem. And we all know that the religious leaders of the day stood up, and they made their case for the fact that people needed to be circumcised. And then, starting with Peter and others, they shared, oh, brothers and sisters, why are we making people try and live under the yoke that we couldn't live under? And what James, who is the pastor of the Church of Jerusalem, when he's writing the people in Antioch, the decision that had been made that day, interestingly enough, this is what he says, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. What does that mean? It means they discerned. They didn't actually decide. What did the Holy Spirit want? And that is so key. What is the Holy Spirit inviting us into? And what is he inviting us into personally? Like, what is he asking from us? And those times only come when we're willing to linger in the presence of Holy Spirit. We're willing to linger in times of just prayer. Gang, it seems totally, totally unproductive. I get it. To be in your office or to be in the car or to be on your couch or to be wherever and just petitioning him and then just listening. I get that that feels unproductive, but those could be the most meaningful times when Holy Spirit downloads things to you, but you won't get those 
if you don't linger. You won't get those if you don't have a commitment to discernment over decisions. Last thing. So um, I've been in this role of being um, a district or regional superintendent for a little over 12 years now. What I have to tell you is that it was less than a year into this role when I figured out that many times it wasn't the lack of the pastor's ability that was the lid on the church. Many times it was the fact that board members were keeping the church from being all that the church wanted to, all God wanted his church to be. And it became very clear to me that most church boards were operating as a business community or as a political community. Let me tell you what I mean by that. You know, I was elected by the congregation to represent the congregation. And what I want to say to boards is, no, you weren't. You were elected to the board so that you could petition Holy Spirit for what he wanted. You were placed in this position so that you would chase after Holy Spirit and ask him, what is he asking our church to do? What is he calling our church to do? You were placed in this position for such a time as this so that you can be God's woman, God's man in this situation to discern his good, perfect, and pleasing will. You're not supposed to represent them. You're supposed, you got that 180 degrees backwards. We're supposed to be representing God to them. That is calling on our life. And friends, if we're going to be spirit-anointed leaders, we need to chase after him so that we experience all that he has for us. And there is abundant life and incredible joy when we're right smack in the middle of what he has for us. Over here, it's striving. We're working. We're working. We're working. Over here, there's a sense in which there's an easy yoke. Doesn't mean that we sometimes don't work hard. Yeah, we still work hard sometimes. Absolutely. But there's an easy yoke because we're in, if you will, the jet stream of the Holy Spirit just pushing us in a beautiful way into all that he has for us. We're not trying to row somewhere. We're experiencing the wind of the Holy Spirit take us where we could only get to with his power. So I want to challenge all of us. Let's chase after him. Let's spend time alone with him. Let's spend time lingering with him. Let's chase after all that he has. And let's make sure that we don't settle for decisions when we could experience discernment. I love you so much. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Spirit and Oriented Podcast. Let me encourage you, follow, subscribe, share this. We want to do our best to serve you and to serve people around you the very best we can. Have a fantastic week. Thanks so much.